All right, we're live. No, in there's no least. video. I thought there'd be an intro for two. There was a right there. <laughs> I was taking. I was taking a break. I didn't know you were coming on so fast. Hey, nope. I don't have anything with Ernst Titovitz except for later on in his life when he was just doing lectures, and mm -hmm. I wasn't sure what to pull from that. But well, from what, what about the photos that I sent you um, of him? I oh, I have. They're, oh, they're oh, okay. Right. Show, we yeah. have photos. Yeah, there's, yeah. I mean, that's him. Yeah. Well, we got to set it up. We can't just jump in the show. I love that some people complain that we kibitz before we get into the show. Here, Hunley's jumping into the show, but we need more kibitz. Oh, well, that, well, well they'll, they'll have more kibbles and bits. Yeah. This is a, an obscure storyline about, just so I could, I got to say something, Eric, right? I mean, I got to. Yeah. I mean. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. This, this is a story of Ernst. Titovitz, Oswald's best friend, when he goes to Minsk uh, after defecting to the Soviet Union a brief time in Moscow, ends up being placed in Minsk. Uh, Titovitz uh, becomes his uh, sidekick. And um, he has other friends because he works in a factory, but uh, Titovitz and I uh, became pen pals. And I, I forgot about this. I, I, he sent me this book. We became pen pals in 2011. Um, his autobiography and his time with, with uh, it's called Oswald Russian episode. So this goes back two years before I even finished the Oswald scripts. Um, so I, I was deep in the research and I found Titovitz and we became pen pals. And at some point he came over here, not to my house, but he actually did a couple of JFK conferences, which are online that you could look at if you want uh, in detail. Uh, when he was promoting the book, he came over and did Coppa, uh, Copa, and he did um, uh, maybe Lancer. I'm not sure which one he did, but he did a couple of um, uh, JFK conferences around 2011 or 2012. Yeah, that's when his book came out. I think it's 2011. Yeah. He he's still. I think he's still around. He did an interview with Jefferson Morley January yeah. Of this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's still alive. He's still alive. But the, the I just wanted to give you the background on this guy because he's not like a flaky dude. I mean, uh, he's an MD, PhD, uh, researcher, author, translator, interpreter, was born in uh, Siberia, graduated from the Minsk Medical Institute, uh, postgraduate study in biochemistry, also a member of the Belarusian national sailing team where he sailed D-class and Fin-class boats, won top prizes in sailing competition. Uh, he earned his advanced degrees from the Academy of Sciences of Belarus and from St. Petersburg State University in Russia. Uh, he's co-authored six research books, Eric, medical research books, mm -hmm. has 14 patents in his name, 400 research papers. And yeah. as an interpreter, he translated three books. And then it goes on. He was at the JFK Research 2013, uh, 2014. He works as a principal researcher at the Research and Clinical Center of Neurology and Neurosurgery in Minsk. Uh, now, even he's probably retired by now, but um, I'm not he, sure. When I looked him up, he, he, I mean, the Oswald stuff was buried. He had so much yeah. medical and yeah. scholarly white papers, et cetera, uh, to his name. It's like, okay, this is not a lightweight dude. By any means. No, but I also believe he's uh, KGB. A good possibility. <laughs> or yeah. Least was for all. I mean, he didn't come out of nowhere. If you could show, there's two photos I wanted you to show. One of his uh, uh, shooting style with a with a gun in his military uniform. That photo, will I'll explain that in a second. Uh, this photo, he goes to a shooting range. This is him in military training, and Oswald is taken to a shooting range and Oswald is shooting a handgun and he takes a position physically Oswald with legs outstretched this way facing the target and uh Titovic says this is how we learn to shoot in Russia sideways Eric you know what I mean mm -hmm. like side saddle almost where you're sidelining Chanted slightly yeah. right so and and Oswald took this position of legs outstretched facing the target and he misses six 
times the target itself, Oswald. It doesn't even hit the target. And the instructor or the, the guy running the firing range comes over and Oswald starts complaining about the sight on the handgun. So the guy takes the handgun from Oswald and shoots five shots, hits four bullseyes with it and misses by an inch uh, on the fifth shot. And Oswald was disgruntled uh, that he was he was just embarrassed that he missed the shot so wide. Uh, but Titovitz explains how they had two different shooting styles. He, Oswald will later later buy a shotgun and go hunting with the hunting and fish club of Minsk, uh, uh, which people don't realize is a great hunting and fish club. And he will uh, then give up hunting and shotgunning uh, because he didn't like the way he was treated on that. But there's multiple weapons in shooting and hunting, which is quite a, a normal pastime in uh, Belarus, uh, you know, as it is in the so Russia in general, mm -hmm. you know, so he he did go fishing a lot with him though. It was funny. Um, Titovitz did a presentation on Oswald that you can find online, and I noticed he juxtaposed the picture of him shooting and Oswald shooting in the Marines. So I, I think oh, he yeah. probably had yeah, yeah, yeah. an ironic story in that part. <laughs> right. Well, he says that they bonded because they, you know, he it's it's compulsory military training in, in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. Uh, not that he was a military guy or anything, um, although I think he was KGB. Uh, and him and Oswald compared notes how similar training was of both armies, uh, uh, both uh, um, uh, Army and Marine Corps, whatever they were both in. And there was a lot of similarities. But one thing that Titovitz points out is um, the military uh, record, the military ID that you get in the Soviet Union is like an entire passport with information. And they reveled at the fact that Oswald had his military ID with all his information on one card sealed in hard plastic. And again, they worship plastic. This was like a big deal with the Soviets. They saw anything plastic, they flipped out. So they were not only flipping out about the card, his ID card, that it had so much info on it uh, that they just had this paper, like a paper uh, passport version, Eric, you know. Mm -hmm. That was really long and blah blah blah. They love and, the plastic; you could wipe the blood off. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> no, they, the, yeah, the the plastic. They were obsessed with plastic in general, you know, in all different parts. And they knew the U.S. had made incredible strides uh, with fiberglass and plastic and boats and chairs and everything else that we don't think of in terms of plastic. But they did not even have plastic until. That's why Webster defected from the last episode to tie this together with Oswald. Webster defected at the uh, uh, the Rand Corporation, Rand Development Corporation's kitchen uh, exhibit at the in Moscow, where they're exhibiting various new plastics, and that's where Khrushchev gets into the debate with Nixon, the so-called famous kitchen debates, uh, where Nixon says our kitchens are ten times better than your kitchens, which was absolutely true. Do they even so, have Bakelite or anything like that? No, I don't know about Bakelite, but they they clearly did not have plastic, you know, mm. so. Anyway, so Titovitz is not your average researcher. And uh, if you could show this picture of him topless, <laughs> this is, is a bad dude. This is Ernst Titovitz, by the way, people. This is not your typical research uh, medical nerd, even though when he met Oswald, I think he was a third year med student uh, uh, when they hooked up together and became his wingman. But look at this is when he was obviously uh, scuba diving. But he became uh, one of the top sailors, I think, Olympic level sailor for the Soviet Union uh, that is in the Olympics or whatever their highest level is. I don't know if sailing's in the Olympics, but he could be going for Mr. Olympia or something there. I mean, that build at that time. Right. I mean, just crazy. Absolutely crazy. And the the connection between the two is that uh, Titovitz, who Obviously, his family is elite when Oswald goes over to his house at one point and his sister is like the leading piano playing uh, a concert pianist in the country, opera singer. They go to the opera together, him and Titovitz. Uh, they see the uh, Queen of Spades opera, Tchaikovsky. Um, so he bonds with Oswald over the idea, which is very common. Remember Ruth Payne and language with with learning Russian from Marina it's all about him brushing up on his English and uh, Oswald learning more Russian. So while it appears to be uh, a normal thing, 
it seems to also be a thing where the only people who speak English in the entire country are KGB people. Regular people are not speaking English. The uh, uh, He's brushing up on it with Oswald, and he will later, I don't, we will get into this in a couple minutes, but Oswald shows up and he's given within nine weeks, he's given a job at this radio factory, and the radio factory makes um, not only radios, but televisions. And it makes all the radios and televisions for the Soviet Union. And uh, this is him with his crew hanging out. Uh, he was the only one that had sunglasses, apparently. So they passed around his sunglasses, the only one that had Levi's. Uh, and people just treated him like a rock star, and they named him Alec. This, this guy uh, at the plant said Lee sounded Chinese. So they changed mm. his nickname to Alec, and uh, he became Alec from then on out. And... Um, he became kind of a rock star in terms of the girls that were working at the plant also because he was able to speak. Although Titovich says his Russian was terrible, Marina said it was flawless. So you've got, again, two different KGB operatives saying completely the opposite. Marina Oswald and Titovich saying he could barely speak Russian and he was isolated by the fact that he couldn't speak Russian. He couldn't communicate with anyone. And, um, uh, Titovitz was his only, as we'll have it, it's his only person he can speak English with. He will later meet a couple of others who speak English, and he will later improve his Russian very much so, uh, where Marina says uh, she felt he was from Estonia or, or, or Lithuania. But uh, Os Titovitz says Oswald told him to say that he was from Lithuania or from Estonia, so it would cover for his bad Russian. Uh, so this idea, according to Titovitz, comes from Oswald himself and uh, not from Marina. So Titovitz uh, will be involved in a couple of things with him. One, where Oswald lives is in the center of, first of all, Minsk is completely leveled uh, by 1945. There is no Minsk. Everything in Minsk is brand new. The opera house is brand new. The movie theater is brand new. The the uh, Belarus military headquarters is brand new. It was destroyed during the war. So from 1949 to 1959, when he gets there, they have rebuilt brand new the entire city. It looks nothing like the old city. Hmm. They have these, these Roman columns. They have Gothic architecture. They completely are building a hotel for Khrushchev. Um, and they didn't do a brutalist? It's various styles. I don't know what, uh, if you look at some of the photos, uh, the opera house looks different than the uh, movie theaters. Everything looks a little different. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, but they did it nicely because the Soviets famously had that brutalist style. Oh, no, no. It's not brutalist at all. Not brutalist at all. It okay. looks like it's set in the 1800s. In oh, fact, nice. it looks like Leningrad. Uh, people have made that analogy that it looked kind of the architecture looked like Leningrad. It's not modern at all. There's nothing modern about it. So he's put into this huge apartment complex over overlooking the uh, uh, Slivach River. Or whatever, I forget how you pronounce this thing. Uh, pardon my uh, pron pronunciations on some of these things, but it's overlooking a river. He's got two two terraces, not one. He's got a living room, a dining room, an ante room, a bedroom. And, and there's a waiting list for a lifetime, as Titovitz points out in his book, to get an apartment. And even the Titovitz family, a lot of times these are three-room apartment areas, and the third room is communal of your apartment. So anybody uses your third room. You know, people just coming and going out of your apartment. It's kind of uh, creepy. And it took Titovitz many, many years to get for his family a, a separate three-room apartment. And the, the waiting list could be decades and indeed it was. And here's Oswald getting this incredible pad in nine weeks. So what everybody knew was he was well connected. If they didn't know his backstory, they knew he was well connected. And they, they have different people who all of a sudden come out of the woodwork to become his friends. And this is one of them um, is Titovitz. Uh, Titovitz shows up. He hears rumors that there's an American in town and in the book. He uh, says, you know, I'm, I'm Lord because of language, Eric, you know, uh, but there's others. There's this guy, Pavel Golachov, whose father was a double 
double hero of the Soviet Union is a thing. Like if you're a hero once and then you get another award, there's like an award for double hero of the Soviet Union. Uh, his name was Golovchev, uh, Pavel. That's him on the right, uh, lower right. That is Rosa on the top left. Now, Rosa, who's got a long name I can't pronounce, was Oswald's translator assigned to him. Uh, he had a thing with her, a uh, fling with her as a translator. And if you go back to that other picture, that's Rosa right there. Yeah, that's his translator. Uh, she was KGB, according to Titovitz. <laughs> Apparently, everyone's KGB except Titovitz. Uh, who's obviously KGB, um, but he did not. But again, look at Titovitz's scientific record. I mean, he does have a pretty good legend and cover story, Eric. Well, it's it, it's somebody that that has that much firepower. Like yeah. I, I knew Jack Barsky, and he was like a genius level um, college professor, et cetera, et cetera. So they did not recruit from low levels. They recruited incredibly intelligent people. So I'm not right, but I'm saying he's got a huge career separately oh, yeah. from being a, a, an official KGB agent. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? He's got a giant career. Uh, sure. On the upper right is Ella German. Now, Ella German is interesting because this becomes Oswald's second girlfriend, uh, first official girlfriend in the Soviet Union. Ella German is Jewish. She will uh, eventually dump Oswald. And uh, this is a weird thing about Ella German. She says to Oswald that, uh, what future do I have with you? You're a spy, <laughs> essentially. You've defected. From and she's pretty blunt. They go to the movies. They date. Uh, she's got a huge uh, front to her. Um, she's very attractive and very smart. She will eventually move to Israel uh, when they uh, allow uh, deportation of Jews to, to escape. Um, but here's the thing I found out about Ella German. Uh, in 19, in the 19, I guess she doesn't leave till the eighties because, uh, as, as far as the eight, eight, late eighties, she's working as a translator for the American ambassador for our embassy. Hmm. She became the translator for us. So it kind of interesting. I don't know if she came back from Israel or this is before she went to Israel, but I think she was spooked out, uh, working for us. This is Ella German. This is a, a, a pretty good picture of her. Uh, that might have been uh, at a young, uh, 19, 20 years of age when he dated her. So anyway, so she uh, becomes his lover and she dumps him and it kind of breaks his heart. But this is before he even meets Marina Oswald. Now, Marina Oswald, as you know, comes from Leningrad. There's some backstory about her. We don't know how sketchy it is. Her, her father is killed in the war. Her mother... Um, remarries. She has a stepfather who uh, does not like her nightlife or social life or whatever life, locks her out of the apartment one night, makes her sleep on the landing of the building in Leningrad. Um, so she is eventually sent to Minsk to live with Valya, her old aunt and her uncle, who is MKV or whatever the military pol uh, intelligence is for the uh, military. Uh, Belarus is a center of the Belarus military and military intelligence. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, here's a little spread about Titovitz showing different things. Violin, yeah. reading the paper, at the research center. So dude had range. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, he was the real deal. But it's funny because they go to this dormitory of the uh, language school and there's a woman's dormitory, and they hit this dormitory every weekend, him and Oswald picking up chicks. Uh, so he becomes Oswald's wingman, and they go to this dormitory where he um, has entree because he's an American and a rock star in that regard. And he's with this guy, Mr. Mr. Atlas. So it's quite a formidable team, uh, the two of them working together. Uh, one being the wingman of the other. I'm not really sure who is the wingman of who, but he's using Oswald as bait because Oswald is such a, a oddity in that world. Now, Oswald gets along very well with the workers in the radio TV factory, he does very well there, and he's making more money than the factory director because he not only has his factory salary, he's got a Red Cross a uh, monthly stipend from the Red Cross that together adds up to be more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
adds up money. <laughs> no, I know, I know. It adds up to be more than uh, uh, the factory director makes. And he goes to this. Uh, there's a, a group, a, a family called the Zygers, and they're Argentinian Jews, I believe, who live in Minsk. Large family with they're they're Argentinian. Uh, they speak Spanish and Russian, and they have parties every weekend. And he's got three gorgeous knockout Latino daughters that attracts everyone in the area for 30 miles. The Zyger gives these wild uh, uh, parties every weekend. And that's where uh, Titovitz meets Oswald for the first time. Now, Oswald's apartment, uh, which is overlooking this river, this plush pad, has in the walls a super advanced, ahead of its time, snake-like camera that the KGB has invented that can snake through the walls. I guess it's like a, a bendable metal uh, that they wire through the wall so the camera little pinhead could come out wherever they want in the apartment. Uh, and on the other side of the wall in the other apartment are four KGB agents 24-7. So his apartment is a little theater. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's literally, you know, uh, the Truman Show. And the KGB. Operation Midnight Climax via yeah, the Soviets. Yeah, on the Soviet, <laughs> style, Soviet style. So, uh, you know, he doesn't really care. He doesn't do anything about it, but he doesn't have a TV. He doesn't have a phone, but he does have a radio. He is able to listen. They don't want to give him a phone. Uh, the theory among the KGB is that uh, they don't want to give him access quickly, quickly to a telephone if something happens. In other words, being able to pick it up as opposed to walking four blocks to go to a phone if something happened. Uh, so, and also waiting for a phone is years. Uh, waiting for a car is years. He doesn't get a car, he doesn't get a phone. But he does have a lot of money, uh, Soviet money, uh, that regard. Uh, and there's a cafe next door. There is a department store. Everything is right there, not because of him, but because of the Minsk elite lives there. Mm. The military elite, the intellectual elite, Everyone lives there so they can all watch him. In other words, they don't put a spy 80 miles outside of the town or the end of the town because he could exit the end of the town. They put spies they're watching in the middle, directly in the middle. So they'd have to go by everyone to get out, if you know what I'm saying. So there's also military sure. stuff there that uh, ends up on Oswald's Minox camera. He does photograph uh, uh, columns of tanks and industrial uh, military hardware that are being built in Minsk. Uh, Minsk is the industrial uh, center of the military. It's like where they make all the military crap. Uh, and he does take photos. They do end up on that Minox camera of his. Hmm. So he did have some ability to be crafty. Well, but not only that, I mean, he goes around as soon as he gets there, he goes to the gum department store, uh, G-U-M, and, and sees, he's just buying crap, wrenches, screws, He's buying uh, little tiny things to see what they add up to. Um, there's literally no rent on the apartment. There's a couple of bucks. Uh, but he's, you know, doing something. And the Soviets are watching him. And the KGB is watching him. And this is what they believe, which they admitted they were wrong. They believe uh, Khrushchev is coming there because they're christening another new hotel. The hotel Minsk, I think it was, or whatever it was called. The Hotel Belarus. Hotel Minsk, I think it was. Brand new hotel. And Khrushchev was coming there, and they believed that Oswald was buying all this crap to assemble a bomb to blow up Khrushchev in that hotel, uh, which not many people remember this, but it's true. And the KGB believed it was true, but it really wasn't true. They finally realized he was just buying random crap, and there was no explosives. Uh, they went through every single thing he bought after he left the store each time. Every store hmm. he went to, they went in and got the receipts and uh, asked them what, they, what he was buying. So, I mean... He wasn't able to operate in the shadows. I mean, everybody knew at one point Titovitz is on the subway with him and the, the subway goes by the KGB headquarters and uh, he's talking to Oswald and they're trying to keep it low. And a guy comes up and goes, you know, who are you? And he goes, why should I tell you? You know, it was a KGB guy who wasn't in on it. You know, just a random guy, not to mention everybody else could rat you out at the same time, you know. So he, they had to be careful about what they were doing. But one of the amazing things are the tapes that Titovitz has. The Titovitz tapes, uh, which we could possibly use for our own thing, uh, for the Oswald uh, uh, AI project, Eric, 
The mm -hmm. Titovitz tapes have never really been released because he owns them and he sat on them. I mean, they're online and I gave them to Eric. Uh, yeah, but I can he, play a little right now. Well, wait, let me just set it up. Hold okay. on. He, what he did was he wanted to uh, record Oswald and himself speaking different accents. Like he was enamored that, it's, that he had a Southern accent, for instance. He was enamored that he had a regional accent and he wanted to learn regional accents. He, he spoke very good English, Titovitz, and even now uh, still speaks even better than he did then, I presume. But he wanted to really finesse it. He, there was a British guy who showed up one time. He met a British guy from the embassy and he, and he studied the British accent and uh, he wanted to really drill down with Oswald. So what he did was he had Oswald and him get together playfully, playfully. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because he has Oswald reads aloud the short story, The Killers by Ernest Hemingway into the tape. And then they create these role playing characters where Titovitz plays a senator from Louisiana, Senator Tito, you know, like the leader of Yugoslavia. And Oswald plays a mass murderer uh, or a serial killer named Jack Marr, a creation that they come up with. And they banter back and forth on these tapes. Um, the reason it's interesting is because the Oswald's Ghost PBS special excerpted the tapes of Oswald as Jack Marr uh, without explaining what I just said and used it as evidence that Oswald was a potential future killer. And what Titovitz says is they were playing around with the tape recorder and they were role playing and coming up with these different characters to kill, uh, to kill time and also to for him to learn the regional accent of Oswald. And Oswald is putting on accents. So this tape that Eric's going to play is of interest to us AI wise and also to the audience. I give the word to Mr. To Mr. Jack Maher, sir. Here you have his voice. God damn well, me Mr. Hitler, shoot up everybody in the goddamn place. Will you tell us about your last killing? Well, there was a young girl under a bridge. She came in carrying a loaf of bread, and I just cut her throat from ear to ear. What for? Well, I wanted the loaf of bread, of course. And what do you think to be your most uh, famous killing in your life? Well, the time, time I killed the uh, eight men on the Bowery the sidewalk, uh, they were just standing there laughing around. I didn't like their faces, so I just shot them all with a machine gun. It, it was very... A little bit violent. Yeah, you know, it's no, difficult I mean, to it's, use it because it's so muddy, it probably won't be useful for AI, but it's interesting historically. Oh, right. No, that's true. But I'm saying for us, um, you know, these mm -hmm. are two 20-year-old uh, military, ex-military talking about killing and doing stuff like that. Uh, he, there's also a recording of him reading The Killers by Hemingway. The point of the matter was that PBS decided to use that excerpt uh, snippet to show that Oswald had the potential to kill everyone on the earth, you know. But uh, Titovitz goes out of his way to uh, protect Oswald and says he, he to this day, uh, does not believe he was a killer involved in the assassination of JFK. So even when he came over here, he still believes that. Now, this becomes very interesting because of... of what I wanted to explain earlier when I was talking to you. The uh, uh, Norman Mailer, the great writer for many, many years, in fact, he spoke uh, as a conspiracy expert for th in a number of years at these conferences, Lancer and COPPA. Uh, I think it was COPPA that he spoke, the Citizens Against uh, Political Assassination. Mailer, uh, in one second, yeah, I'll just get to this, but just to set it up, Mailer believed, you can leave it up, it doesn't matter. Um, Mailer believed in the conspiracy that there was a conspiracy to kill uh, uh, Kennedy, uh, as did you know a bunch of other people, Oliver Stone, other writers, and they, he'd signed documents as such. And um, he had spoken at conferences, Eric, uh, in Dallas. That's how mm -hmm. much uh, Mailer was into this. So Mailer uh, gets approached to do a book, and the book he's approached to do is a book that will later come out uh, to be. Oswald's Tale. Um, if people could see that. Uh, yeah, this is Oswald's Tale by Norman Mailer. It's uh, about 900 pages. Uh, uh, thanks to the book fund, the JFK book fund, by the way. A little light reading, stop a bullet. Yeah, well, it's, it's in two parts. And I'm going to set this up because it's very important because the book is Oswald in Russia and then Oswald in the United States. It's part one, part two. And he, Mailer, uh, 
wants to go over and interview these people, gets a gets a contract from Random House to do this book. And this is, I want to say, this is in 1994, 1995, right? Mm -hmm. And there's another book, while they're negotiating, there's another book being, being negotiated and written at the same time by Random House. And that is a book called Case Closed by Gerald Posner. Uh -huh. that, that right so he has a contract from 92 uh posner to do his book case closed so it's also random house so this book that they want random house is a non-conspiracy book they want a book that says there is no conspiracy and mailer is almost 70 now he's an alcoholic he's drunk in case people don't know norman mailer he had six wives one of them he stabbed trying to kill her uh, almost to death, a uh, legendary alcoholic, punch Gorby doll in the face on a TV show, ran for mayor in New York, got into the boxing ring with a bunch of people, became a pugilist in his mind, um, a real train wreck of a man. Some of his books are great. He came out of journalism. Some of them blow. Uh, it's a mixed bag, uh, which is common with alcoholic writers. You know, you could look at Jersey Kosinski, you could look at, at uh, uh, Fear and Loathing and, and Thompson. Uh, so anyway, he hooks up with a guy named Lawrence Schiller. And Lawrence Schiller is a deep state operative, not unlike Dan Moldea, um, who we covered sort of with the RFK Searhunt thing, I think, Eric. And mm -hmm. Dan Moldea is another guy who wrote a book about the Searhunt assassination and most recently got involved with RFK Jr. trying to shake him down for money to interview Thane Eugene Caesar the actual killer of RFK Jr.'s father. Uh, he was his uh, uh, protector. In other words, each of these figures, and this includes Marina Oswald, by the way, this includes Ruth Payne, this includes every single one of them have handlers uh, to keep you away. The way they keep you or me away is to say it's $25,000 to interview Ruth Payne or it's $25,000 to interview Thane Eugene Caesar. And RFK Jr. said, as he got closer to going to the Philippines to interview Thane Eugene Caesar, uh, Moldea just kept raising the price. It went from 10 to 15 to 20 to 25 to 30, day by day by day. And he realized he was fucking with them and he was never going to get to interview him. This is what they do. And this becomes part of Marina Oswald's uh, life as well. And that's why she's not living in isolation. You can't get to her. She's got handlers as well around her as a deep state operative or protected person. Uh, but there's one guy who is able to get to her, and that's Lawrence Schiller. And Lawrence Schiller, that's him working at his desk. We'll, we'll get to the early part of his career in a second, but I just want to get onto this book deal with Norman Mailer. They get $870,000 to do this book, Eric. Wow. This is in 1993 money, right? Whew. 870, 50 goes to um, uh, uh, Schiller and 50 goes to Mailer. Now, Schiller is the guy who does all the research. Schiller is famous for one thing before this. He's famous for a lot of things. But the one thing that we know him as, as the uh, uh, researcher for uh, 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 Albert Goldman in the uh, book, Ladies and Gentlemen, Lenny Bruce, which is considered by many to be this uh, uh, incredibly salacious, false portrayal of Lenny Bruce. And that's from Lawrence Schiller. Uh, Lawrence Schiller, a uh, very contentious interviewer, very contentious researcher, very contentious uh, uh, writer, uh, but he will become a big figure in this story in Russia uh, right now because he gets this money from Random House, uh, almost a million dollars. They had done Execution a Song together. They had mm. done the story of Gary Gilmore together. They had worked together on numerous books. So uh, Schiller is a big time player at this time. Now, just so you know, uh, before we go forward with Schiller, we got to go backwards. And Schiller starts out in, in photographing and unusually, that's him, that Schiller is, he is a paparazzi, right? But he ends up working for Life magazine. And he works for Life magazine and he publishes with Look, but he's working for Henry Luce at Life. And he hooks up with this obscure blonde named Marilyn Monroe. And he is able to get into her good graces to photograph Marilyn Monroe poolside. These are the photographs of, of uh, Lawrence Schiller. Uh, lived in San Diego, came from Brooklyn, but he moved out here. Marilyn Monroe, he recently had a Tashin book made. This is about five years ago. 
uh, of the photos that weren't released, the book sells for about $1,400, you know, one of those Tash and coffee table books. So he takes these photographs of Marilyn Monroe, including the iconic photo on the cover of Life, which you may have. Uh, the, 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 the one that really put her on the map was the Life magazine cover, uh, which he does. Now, he is everywhere, Lawrence Schiller. Lawrence Schiller, not only photograph, that's, the, that's Lawrence Schiller, by the way. He took that photo. That's who Lawrence Schiller is. So Lawrence Schiller becomes this, um, like a set photographer for movies. He ends up, um, he ends up shooting Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid as a set photographer. Uh, you know what I mean, Eric, on the set, shooting stills in movies. That's how he gets into the movie business. That's how he gets into, here he is with, with uh, uh, Robert Redford and, and, and Paul Newman at, at their house uh, playing uh, ping pong. So Schiller worms his way in. Well, you know, I don't begrudge the guy, but he he's just a set photographer in the movie business. Yeah, and he um, <clears throat> he photographed. I mean, just about everything. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Right here is the he photographs every iconic photo you ever saw. Now we're going to get to this in a second because. It, I want to show you the Oswald gun photo where he's holding the Carcano over his head, the Dallas police detective. I want to show you the photo of Oswald uh, yelling at the uh, uh, police in, in his lineup in the Dallas police station. He is there, Schiller, for every single photo, every famous photo of Oswald. They're all, that's a shot by Schiller. He's there. Show the next shot of Oswald if you have it. Um, that's Schiller. He's there. No, no, no. This is unbelievable. Lawrence Schiller is everywhere. Now let's move into RFK. Show some RFK photos that I I, I, I sent you over. Hang on. I'm gonna... Okay. It's an <clears throat> this is RFK. This is the night before uh, uh, the primary in California. Uh, RFK doing his RFK uh, on the stump. He's with RFK shooting photos of RFK literally to the moment he's killed people. Okay, this is a guy who is in either coincidentally in the right place at the right time or put in the right place at the right time. Uh, he's the Forrest Gump. Yeah, a little bit more will be revealed that he's more than Forrest Gump. So um, let me see. Oswald, you got that photo. Right, Marilyn Monroe. Okay, so anyway, so getting back to his career, he, after the assassination, he decides that he is, uh, is going to make some TV movies, Eric. Now he begins to make TV movies, and, and one of the ones he makes is uh, The Trial of Lee Harvey Oswald. And during the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald, it, these are all TV movies that he was affiliated with as a producer, um, he befriends Marina Oswald and he gives Marie, he goes to Marina Oswald and he knows that Marina Oswald's life story has already been purchased by Patri Patricia McMillan Johnson. And she is sitting on that book for 12 years, icing out anybody who can do anything with her story. But you can't, Schiller knows that you can't show any intimate relationship between her and Lee Harvey Oswald without getting the life rights of uh, uh, Marine Oswald. So what does he do? He goes to Marine Oswald and says, I know you've sold your life rights for X amount of money, which is enormous, to uh, the book company uh, for the book uh, Lee, me, Lee and Me, right? Uh, me and Lee by Priscilla McMillan uh, Johnson, who's outed by uh, Max uh, Good in the uh, uh, Ruth Payne documentary. I know there's a lot of names coming at you, but these all all these dots connect. So there's a lot of dots in this episode, so try to hang in there. Um, anyway, so he goes to her and he says, I know you have signed your life rights, but I want you to sign this letter. And the letter he gives us says, I will not sue Lawrence Schiller. <laughs> he's, no, no, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. He's, no one's ever done this, and they do it now all the time. He comes up, he, but this is when you've already sold your life rights, Eric. Think about right. the genius of this, because he couldn't buy your life rights. It was already sold. So he comes up with a letter and, and one pager saying, I, Marina Oswald, for this, this sum, he gives her 
first $25,000. Then he gives her $15,000. And she says, okay, I'll do that. So she signs a letter, I will not sue Lawrence Schiller, no matter hell or high water. So he makes the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald, terrible movie, Ben Gazzara, bunch of, I think, uh, Lorne Green, Lorne Green plays uh, the uh, the uh, prosecuting attorney, or he plays one of the attorneys, Lorne Green, uh, <laughs> from, from Bonanza. Um, anyway, so he makes this uh, trial of Lee Harvey Oswald, and he gets involved in making one, one movie after another. Now, they're not... Uh, theater movies. These are all TV movies, made for TV. And he, um, I just want to give you some of these credits. In television, uh, Overkill, the John Benet Ramsey story. Here he is. The secret tapes. He will now become involved. Uh, I don't want to jump ahead of 2015, but he gets involved in 2000 in American Tragedy, uh, Master Spy, the Robert Hansen story. He goes back to Russia for that in 2002. He does Peter the Great. He goes to Russia for that. In 1986, he does Peter the Great. Now, this is such a big budget thing. He's right out of the gate. Right out of the gate, he is the executive producer and co-director on a huge budgeted NBC 1986 mini called Peter the Great. And he goes to Russia and he spreads money around and bribes and cajoles and gets stories out of people in Russia, 1986. The reason this story is important is he receives two Emmy Awards, Time Magazine, Best of the Year, Hollywood Reporter, Best of the Decade for this miniseries, and he's never directed anything in his life. Okay, he's never researched, he doesn't know anything, he's got no degree, high school dropout, you know, we went to Pepperdine, and he studied at Pepperdine, and after Pepperdine became this, um, this uh, paparazzi guy, right? So he does in 1976, is the story I'm telling you, is the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald, where he's the producer on that. And the, that, uh, which is terrible, Marina Oswald doesn't like him because it's so bad, uh, but she got $35,000, so she shut her trap and took the money. Now, Marina Oswald will get hundreds of thousands of dollars, people. Not only will she get a book deal, uh, or the, her, light, her life rights book deal with Pris Priscilla McMillan, she will also receive in the mail thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of people who just felt sorry for her, who mailed her tons of money in in the mail, you know, um, housewives and various people. So she had that coming in. She remarries to Porter and then gets divorced from Porter and uh, now lives in Dallas. But what's important is in this story, when uh, he hooks up with Mailer, when Schiller hooks up with Mailer, he goes back he goes back to Dallas, uh, uh, Schiller, and he calls on Marina Oswald once again. And he says, Norman Mailer wants to do this story. He's the greatest American writer, as you know. He's the American Tolstoy, and he's speaking on behalf of Mailer. We want to put you into the uh, uh, Omni Hotel in Dallas for five days. You're going to be a prisoner for five I swear to God. They, they're going to put her in the Dallas hotel for five days. We're going to interview you around the clock for this book. Uh, the one I, I was just showing you, the Norman Mailer book, uh, Oswald's Tale. So she says, well, I really don't want to do that. Can I bring my girlfriend? And they say, yeah, you can bring a girlfriend. You just can't sit in on the interviews. So they put her in a room and they literally interview her uh, for five days straight. And he, he to convince her, his wife at the time, Schiller's wife, Stephanie, takes her to Malibu Beach, brings her to California. They wine and dine her with the kids. Stephanie's got a couple of kids with Schiller. Uh, this is his second wife. He will have a third wife that fits into this story in a second. Now, Titovitz is going to come back into this story, too. But right now, Schiller is whining and dining Marina to get her again to do another interview. None of these interviews are ever released. These are all buried in deep state files somewhere in Schiller's archives. So he goes back to her, gives her some more money. She sits for five days in the hotel. Her and Mailer interrogate her, and they want to know about her sex life. She's getting angry. She's getting in huge fights with them. At one point, there was a great quote from her, um, which she says, showing who she really is. She says, you, you can't use all your capitalistic tricks on me. I mean, who says that? 
other than someone who's a Soviet agent, you know, I mean, really? That's that's what the mother of two kids says? I think not. So anyway, they get what they want out of her, which is basically mm-hmm. nothing. That becomes the second half of the book, Oswald's Tale. But getting back to the first half of the book, this is an 800-page book. It should have been two books. Schiller gets in tons of fights with Mailer in Minsk. And I mean knockdown, drag out fights because they're both two drunks who were just sh- drinking vodka and, you know, baying at the moon, these two guys. So he comes over with bribery money, uh, Schiller. He's got $10,000 in bribery money and he hooks up with a, with a translator, ex-KGB. Her husband's been assassinated, KGB guy. Uh, and keep in mind, the Soviet Union is collapsing around them, Eric. This is Boris Yeltsin time. This is they're sent over to get from the deep state the Oswald files from the KGB, the KGB of Belarus. And Norman uh, Mailer, this is Yeltsin, obviously, here. I don't know who the other guy is, but he'll come up. He's yeah. in the, story. The, 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 the situation becomes where Mailer is really a dupe. He's being used by Schiller and the deep state to get in behind enemy lines to write this book and interrogate and get the Oswald files. At one point, Schiller is contacted by the FBI and says, you know, Bill Clinton is the president now and he wants Yeltsin to give him the Oswald files. We're coming to your house to see what the hell you've got. Uh, This is when he comes back and uh, he won't let them. The KGB won't let him scan the documents. What they do is they rent him an office. This is in Minsk. They rent him an office for 1000 American dollars a week. This is during the collapse of the Soviet Union, right? And they tell him to write him and Mailer. They tell him to write down any questions they have. And we'll go down the hall to where the files, the files are literally down the hall. They're in the KGB headquarters. We'll go down the hall and find the appropriate file that, that is close to the answer to that question and bring it back. You could then copy it by hand in Russian, and the translator can translate it, and that's as good as it's going to get, which is what they do. Okay. At the end, Schiller is worried and Mailer is worried that no one's going to believe them, so they smuggle out copies of the actual KGB files, but that's later in the Mm. story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do. And they go in three separate airports. This uh, Ludmila, Ludmila is the translator for Schiller. Her husband's been killed. She's KGB. He was KGB. Ludmilla becomes the honeypot for Lawrence Schiller. Lawrence Schiller not only is having an affair with her, uh, she's a knockout, like 5'11", beautiful Russian uh, spy. Uh, He marries her in Minsk, marries her again in Bel Air, California, when he comes back. She gets her green card in the mail, immediately divorces him. <laughs> the perfect tradition. Honey, the perfect honey pot tradition. Uh, she immediately divorces him. And he goes, oh, well, that was his third wife. And uh, Mailer's on his sixth. So I don't know who he hooked up with their Mailer. But uh, both of them are drinking around the clock. Both of them uh, you know, get these files. And here's where Titovitz comes in. They interview Titovitz five times. Titovitz tells them to go fuck themselves. And each interview, he's politely, I mean, he says this politely, they want dirt on Oswald. They want peccadillos on Oswald. They want weirdness about Oswald. And he will not throw them under the bus. He keeps telling them we were very close friends and I'm not going to do that. And Schiller just gets angrier and angrier at Titovitz, trying to break him down. You know, he doesn't need the money, Titovitz. He won't buckle. And uh, he really has some really bad words to say about Schiller as a sleazebag uh, later on in life. And, you know, when he's interviewed about Schiller. Um, Anyway, so they try to get this information out of him uh, to no avail. They want to make a lone nut book. And he doesn't believe that Oswald was involved in the assassination in any way, shape or form, Titovitz. And to this day has stuck to his guns. So he won't denounce him, and they just keep interviewing him. Eventually, he says, you know, I'm going to write my own book someday, which he does, you know, in 2010. So I could see why he wouldn't want to uh, contradict his own his own self sure. about, yeah, about it. Plus, he, I think he really believes it. And he didn't want to burn his material. 
I mean, it's like this is exclusive material that he has. That well, nuts to release it. Schiller knew that he was going ballistic over it, and a lot of it is in the in this book, Oswald Russian episode, uh, which surprisingly I, I just saw had an inscription to me. Oh, <laughs> so, look, you look at that! I, I forgot how close we were. I, I, you know, it's funny. I forgot about this guy. Um, but then I, I, we were researching this episode. I realized that we have a whole mess of emails together and stuff. But anyway, so the, the thing about Titovitz is he won't cooperate with them. And the Oswald book is now being turned into a lone nut book. And Mailer, who has believed in the conspiracy entire life, his entire life, the entire time they're in Russia, he has huge blowups of every page of the Warren report on his wall. Every day, Schiller and this woman have to, because his eyesight was failing, blows up page after page. He's reading the entire Warren report for two years. The book takes a number of years to make this uh, uh, Norman Mailer book. But he is now completely ensconced in the Warren report. And what he does for part two of the book is he takes the Warren report and he romanticizes it in prose. He he writes this, and every couple of minutes, he'll every couple of pages, he'll put in, you know, CE exhibit 286. He'll put that in the middle of the block. And he reads Posner's book. Posner's book comes out uh, yeah. in 93 and destroys them, completely destroys them. And this is what happens to Dan Moldea. Uh, Dan Moldea uh, famously goes from uh, 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 the Sirhan book where there's a conspiracy to kill RFK to the end of his very book. And he, he says, no, there was no conspiracy changes his mind. His publisher flips out. They published the book anyway, 99% of the book by Dan Moldea about the Sirhan, uh, case shows that there's a conspiracy to kill RFK. Now what happens to Dan Moldea? Well, he jumps onto another book, the trial of OJ Simpson. What does Lawrence Schiller do? He jumps onto another book, The Trial of O.J. Simpson. He embeds himself in the dream team. He's at the desk with them, Eric. At Just like these guys did with Sirhan with that case, he's now sitting at the defense table, Schiller. And only people of a deep state world can have the muscle to do what, what, what Schiller is doing all through his career. It's really crazy. He, he makes a... Um, I'm just trying to remember the name of the uh, movie that he did on. Um, I think it's called American Tragedy around 2000. Oh, right. Anatomy Cold Case he does on John Bonet. Oh, the secret tapes of the OJ case. He writes the book with OJ. The book that OJ said, I, 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 the book that he did, it's co written by Lawrence Schiller. The Untold Story, O.J. Speaks, The Hidden Tapes, which becomes a uh, a and &E Networks thing and a special. Um, so he does that with with uh, 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 O.J. Simpson. Was that so, also called If I Did It? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's that one. Yeah. That that got Judith Regan fired from. Uh, I think King. that's the I think that's the book. He definitely did the TV show. He produced that from that book. I'm just trying to look at the. The, the book so was, there, no, 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 was no. Mailer's book good or bad? I'm having a bad okay. Feeling. Okay, so the, the first half of the book is fantastic, which okay. is him, him in, 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 in Russia. The second half is straight Warren Commission. So Schiller and him have a huge fight because Schiller realizes this is two books and not one. He's only got 20% ownership of this book. The other books he did with Mailer, he had 50% and he had more muscle. But in this book, he only has 20 percent. And Mailer does not want to die without writing about the Kennedy assassination. And that's what's driving Mailer. And Mailer completely flips after 30 years to become a lone nutter for this book because of Gerald Posner. And Lauren Schiller says that's the power of Gerald, uh, uh, Gerald Posner's book, that it was able to flip people like Norman Mailer. And that's why it was worth being made. And that's true. That's absolutely true. Case closed. If you look at the ripple effect of case closed, it forces one of the great American literary lions, uh, Norman Mailer, to alter his entire viewpoint on the case and become a lone nutter after 30 years of even speaking at conferences. Damn. 
And now Posner's uh, answering tweets all the time under us. <laughs> right. And, he, you know, I mean, also became a plagiarist. And, and then he wrote a book on um, kind of rehabilitated himself by writing a book on the pharmaceutical industry in Purdue, uh, which mm. came out, I think, two or three years ago, which is a, considered a very good book. The Sacklers? But, about them? I don't think it's about the Sacklers. I think it's about uh, 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 Purdue itself. It might be about the Sacklers. I'm not sure. I, I'm afraid to read the book. But Schiller is not done. Schiller, Schiller continues, and I, I know this is hard to believe, but Schiller will eventually uh, travel to China in 2005 and put together one of the most extensive Chinese art collections in contemporary history, over 80 paintings obviously being paid off by the Chinese. Uh, in 2007, he, he did the uh, Marilyn Monroe book I was talking about as a gallery uh, opening. But... He gets into the John Benet Ramsey case. But here's the most fascinating thing I found about Schiller, which I, I'm going to have to do some more research on. Um, I don't even know how to explain this. This is how deep state Schiller is. He's the rep he was the representative of the United States in the USA, USSR, bilateral talks in Moscow and Washington, drafted and signed treaties with the government of the USSR. OK, he was also the representative from the United States government to Moscow for the International Peace Forum. That's how deep these guys go, Eric. This is not just a paparazzi photographer who shot Marilyn Monroe. He was there when they wheeled out Marilyn Monroe's dead body. He was there when they killed the Kennedys. He was there before they killed the Kennedys. He was there when Oswald was brought out. He then goes to Russia to try to get the secret KGB files. He's intercepted by the FBI. who They want them. I mean, the, the FBI is hassling him to get the files. I mean, who are these people that are so deep state that the FBI can't touch them, Eric? That's why I wanted to do this story was because the relationship between Schiller and Titovitz uh, and Titovitz holding his own as, you know, whether it was a KGB operative or not, refuses to buckle and 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 give up the ghost of, of Oswald. Now, this becomes... Oswald's ghost is a chapter in the book, Oswald's Tale. Oswald's ghost becomes the butchered, insane propaganda, two-part uh, PBS special, Who is Lee Harvey Oswald? So uh, that becomes part of Schiller's. Gus Russo's in there. All these lone nutters are in there. And that becomes the official PBS frontline documentary phony series on Oswald, which included that clip that you just played, the audio clip, to demonstrate how violent uh, 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 Oswald would become and could be. Now, Schiller has wormed his way so far into the anus of the JFK community that he is the official consultant to the JFK library. Mm. <laughs> He's wormed his way into the family now. And he lives out in Woodland Hills. He's still alive. But uh, what an in incredibly, in just the craziest story they will bring um, they will bring her aunt, uh, uh, Marina's aunt, to visit her as part of the agreement to the United States uh, uh, of Alia. Uh, and they will bring the aunt from Minsk to this is like in the 90s, in the 80s and 90s. And she doesn't like it here <laughs> in Texas. She didn't like Texas and goes back to Minsk. She was upset. The aunt didn't want to live here. Uh, they thought they were doing her a, a favor, but uh, apparently the aunt didn't like being here, so she went back. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the, Valia, the uh, Marina's aunt. We'll get into Valia some more when we do uh, the Marina Oswald episodes, probably two parts on Marina Oswald. But there's, there's some scuttle, but they get into a, a debate with uh, Marina. She claimed she was a virgin when she had sex with Oswald, when she married Oswald and they had sex on her wedding night. Oswald took uh, famously took a segment of a bloody sheet to the factory to show that his wife was a virgin. Um, <laughs> oh, <good God. laughs> no, I'm not kidding. I'm not, I'm not kidding. So they um, were trying to get out of her that she was not a virgin. And she hates Lauren Schiller's guts so much now. I mean, dude, the hatred of Marina towards Lauren Schiller is now legendary. She hates his living guts. He has burned every bridge, but he but he did what he did. He got what he wanted out of her, gave her the money, and uh, you know she'll hate his guts when even in the afterlife. Yeah, his uh, the check cleared. Who cares? 
<laughs> right. Yeah, but they were grilling her about her sex life, and she was screaming at them in this hotel, the Omni in uh, Dallas, uh, in the '90s when they were doing this, and she didn't want any part of it. I mean, you know, why she would fight so hard about that is, you know, up to her, I guess. I mean, there were different stories about her being quite, you know, sexual, you know, having multiple partners. Uh, but I, I don't know why she feels so strongly about it. Uh, they interviewed a bunch of her girlfriends in Minsk. Um, you know, she was stunning. I don't know. I mean, maybe premarital sex was taboo back then. You know, uh, maybe it was, maybe it's the way he treated her. I mean, locking I think her so. up in I the hotel so. for for a couple days, and if they if they're really rude to her, or was undignified. I mean, it could just be a personal. Grudge. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've read. That way. I know it, it kind of became, I got the feeling and, and, and that's kind of what happened, you know, that he was just, he's such a lug shiller, you know what I mean? He's such a heavy hand and, and, you know, he was somehow latched on to Norman Mailer early on and just rode that uh, train until he was dead and became the Dan Moldea, you know, of that situation with, uh, with, with Mailer. He wouldn't let anybody near Mailer. I mean, Mailer obviously had his own life. But he would he would do all the questioning. He would do all the interrogations. He would do most of the uh, research for Mailer. He also made these deals for Mailer, which is highly unusual. He made these financial deals on behalf of himself and Mailer, book deals, which is really bizarre. You know, because Mailer had agents and managers and everything else. Uh, but him and Schiller had a love-hate relationship, definitely. Wow, it sounds like... Um... He was Mailer's handler, too. Right. That's what I was getting at. That's what I was getting at. Because Mailer uh, was just an alcoholic. He died of, I think, renal failure, technically, Mailer, uh, 2005-ish, around there. But a, a complete train wreck of a man. You know, complete train wreck of a man. Six wives. You know, Didn't he, get, he got a killer out who then went and killed some other Oh, people. Abbott. Yeah, he got Abbott out and uh, in the belly of the beast. Uh, sensationally got Abbott released from prison who immediately killed again when he got out. Abbott had learned to some creative writing in prison. And uh, Mailer was, again, the, the front man of a liberal leftist cause to free an innocent man. Um, and he freed him and he killed again. And, uh, and he never lived that down. I, I, think, I think that was the end of Mailer after Abbott. That might have, yeah, that might have put him on the sauce pretty hard or helped to mm -hmm. exacerbate the situation. Because I, yeah. I would feel like, you know, so guilty over that. Right. And good God. But they flipped him into a lone nutter, which was the goal of, of Schiller and Random House and that group. Uh, so that book, you know, that could have been a conspiracy book, which is what, how it started out. And it didn't end up that way. It ends up as a Warren Commission he kept telling him not to put so much faith in the Warren Commission. Schiller was getting nervous, you know, about the, that it was just completely a Warren Commission book, which is what it is. Um, that's why I, most people in the JFK research community never, ever mentions Oswald's Tale uh, because it's a lone nut book, you know, written by a great writer. But, you know, it, it, it's out there. It's out there if anybody wants to. Uh, read 800 pages like I'm doing on well, 400 uh, of them. 400. The other 400. Yeah. Well, the other 400. Guess what Schiller has that that um, uh, Mark Shaw claims he has. Dorothy Kilgallen. Nope. Interview with Jack Ruby at the trial. Oh, really? That's oh, really? And Mark Shaw keeps claiming that Dorothy Kilgallen was the only one to interview uh, Jack Ruby. At the no. trial, and 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 he has it, Lawrence uh, Schiller, and of course he won't release it. I kind of believe that he did, though. Who Schiller? Yeah, oh, with the access that. Oh no, 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 no! Sure he did. Oh no, at the back, at the end of the book. Oh no, no, it's it's pretty well documented in the book. Yeah, no, mm. they had access to Ruby, and um, he interviewed Jack Ruby. Uh, but I'm saying Mark Shaw continues to say. The only one who had access to interview uh, uh, Jack Ruby was Dorothy Kilgallen. It's just not true, folks. It's just not true. And there were others. I, it was funny because at the end of the book, I saw this footnote, and it, it was the first footnote on the Ruby chapter, and it was Lawrence Schiller's uh, personal interview with Jack Ruby. Oh, sweet. I'll have to check that out. So there, so there is value in the book, at least pieces of it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you got to have it. Yeah, and um, once again... 
this I mean this is a heavy pay this is a paperback but um the uh this is from I mean Christopher Hitchens says a narrative of tremendous energy and panache the author at the top of his form the the, the first half of the book is absolutely true it, it, he is at the top of his game I mean Mailer is a great writer I mean he's easy reading he's not mm-hmm. complicated reading I mean he um you know, some of these are interviews printed uh, within the book, uh, but this, you know, thanks to the JFK Book Fund people for paying for this. That's where your money goes. This was before your time, so I had this <laughs> fifteen <laughs> years ago. But yeah, well, but you that didn't pay for that one. If that was signed, it might have gotten sent to you. So maybe yeah, it was. Pay. It was sent to me from, from <laughs> with. It was sent from Russia with love, which is kind of funny. There you, you know? go. Yeah. All right. Well. <laughs> Crazy, crazy story. You did have a couple more pictures you wanted to pull. Yeah, what else you got there? Let me see what Uh, you got. I forgot what I sent you. You got Stanislav Shuskovich or whatever. He is the one who is shaking hands with Yeltsin. He is the president of Belarus. Okay, so that cat, yeah, that cat realizes that something's going on and he shows up at these events because he feels there's a lot of noise around this. I got to get in there. So he shows up and introduces himself. But Schiller... Uh, spends so much money on the black market for food and drink and everything else that he he literally has to go back to the United States to smuggle more money into Belarus so they could live. He said he said the food, everything, the heating systems, everything was so bad that it was hard for them to creatively work, which I could definitely understand. Hmm. And then you had a have me look up David Haywood Schwartz and. I got one picture of the dude. I ran it two different ways. It's not easy to see. He's the guy in the middle. Okay, so this is um, the ambassador, Moscow, U.S. ambassador to Moscow, who hires Ella German, the uh, former girlfriend. Uh, I, I just find it ironic that the girlfriend of Lee Harvey Oswald works for the U.S. ambassador to Moscow. That's the one of the great little side stories you stumble onto in this research community that nobody knew about uh, up, up until recently when I cross-referenced a bunch of things. The fact that Oswald's girlfriend worked for the guy in the U.S. Embassy where he denounced his own U.S. citizenship. He wasn't there. This is much later, but he wasn't there then. But the U.S. ambassador uh, to Moscow is that guy, and Ella Germain worked for him, which is really funny. Wow, insane story. and A lot of dots. I hope you, I hope you reach back out to... Um... Ernst again. That would be really cool if we, mm-hmm. you know, get some communication with them before. I know, didn't know he was still. To be honest with you, I didn't know he was still doing media. I'll definitely reach out to him. Yeah, he did uh, that interview with um, uh, Jefferson Morley or whatever. Okay. And yeah. Well, my was- favorite story is this Ludmila, who marries Schiller and then dumps him. I mean that that's the best way, and marries him twice. And she just keeps hawking him through. This is, in the, this is in some other interviews with Schiller that I found. But she just keep, and she's in the book as the interpreter. She's interpreting. By the way, she's interpreting things that in her own ways, Schiller says, to help them. And of they, course. yeah. So I mean, and she's KGB. So who knows who said what? You know, as as she would. Let me make sure. Don't have any rumble rants, but we do have a couple super chats. So we got Lauren here's a new member. Um, BTK Soviets didn't offer old fat babushkas as bait. No, real honeypots. You know, at one point he <laughs> says, the first time he meets uh, Titovitz meets Oswald, he he he's speaking broken English as you can hear on the tape, mm-hmm. and he says, uh, at, at the end of the evening. He says, I'm sorry. He wants to say, I'm sorry to have imposed on you, right? And just to be polite, like the whole asking him a million English questions all night. You know what I mean? What's a radio? How do you say this? How do you say that? You know, and Oswald didn't care, but he says, instead of saying, I'm sorry to impose on you, he says, I shall expose you. And Oswald flips out. I guess. (laughs) Yeah. And he goes, what the fuck are you talking about? I shall expose you. And he goes, what? And he didn't realize he meant to say, I'm sorry to impose on you. It's in the book. It's just a great moment by Titovitz um, talking about, a- you know, language problems. And um, this is the little gun that I just got from the Soviet Union, the little tiny gun <laughs> that Titovitz used. 
Uh, Helena Olgenek, uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge about Oswald, all this intrigue. Yeah, we're just getting started on Oswald. I mean, if you want to hear part one um, on locals of the Oswald miniseries. Which is fully up now. Um, the first draft of part one is up. We're going to go on to part two, three, four, five, and then go back and start you know, tweaking uh, part one. So part one is in Russia is why, what I was going to say. So it's, it's relevant to Titovitz. Uh, in the, this first part of the uh, uh, miniseries, which is on locals, which is uh, people could join and 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 listen to to the heart's content. Um, but you know, it's funny because like on locals, I put up this thing of Oswald speaking to the press, not the WDSU radio thing, but there's just him talking to the press, and he does speak in a kind of monotone voice, Eric. Mm -hmm. And people are saying, well, the AI is monotone. That's him. That's how he spoke. I put up some samples of him in public, mm -hmm. uh, which Eric has used for the AI, but that's how the guy spoke. I can't help you. You know, as a comparison, listen to the narrator and it's Mark. And that, so you can kind of say, you've heard Mark, that sounds like Mark, mm -hmm. and the pattern is there. But Oswald has this kind of stilted pattern when he talks. It's uh, I he, I think it's like a guy trying to sound educated. You know, watching his words, you know, carefully. But it is like, like or a monotone. spy. Or a spy, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I'm a Marxist, a Leninist, and uh, I, well, that's different than a Marxist. And he's very specific because, it, I, I, it, like in the radio interview, he's like, no, I wouldn't say that. Yeah. It's, and, you know, he's very, very specific about different things. Um, but yeah, unstructured.locals.com. If you're an annual member, you'll have access to oh, there all it is. of the it. Oswald audio scripted dramas as they come out. It's five parts. Mark wrote it. And Oliver Stone was the executive producer and was on board to direct it. And I believe worked with you and and put you through some well, hell. Work is a, is a generic term. Work, this is worse than work. Work <laughs> is like you go to a place and do a job, go home. Uh, this is a guy calling you three o'clock in the morning, screaming at you, you know. I don't know if that's work. But you have memories. <laughs> you have it's, called memories. PTSD. it's called PTSD. <laughs> All right, David Parson. Did Marina know that Austin Gal who munched? Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know what that means. Yeah, it sounds like a, a Ruth Payne reference, but from somebody. Oh, who, I see what you're saying. I get you from another. Uh, I'm guessing. Right? I don't know. It's a, oh, I, I remember that now. Very, very, very good. I don't think so. Yeah. And Dave Lund says, Mrs. Zapruder was a babushka lady. I uh, don't think so. don't think so, but worth two, two pounds, I guess. Thank you. Um, Sergeant Willie, so many dots, it's getting hard yeah, to see the map. The more I go into this, this is all new to me, too. A lot of the Schiller stuff is new. The Schiller stuff is all new to me, but the Titovit stuff I knew about. Uh, but I didn't know about the intersection of Schiller and Titovitz, you know, deep state meeting, deep state possibly, you know, over these files. Um, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. That is wild. And GG Evan three seventeen, new to the channel, and I have a question about the Carcano rifle. How do you think came up with the idea for Oswald to have that rifle given its nickname? I'm thinking the Mafia. What is the nickname? What does it have to do with him, though? I don't know. I don't know. That's it. Yeah. Uh, check out uh, GG Evan three seventeen. Check out a lot of the JFK Q and As because the Carcano rifle and rifles they come up a bunch in there. Maybe, oh maybe yeah. some, Maybe you'll find something in there that'll cover Satisfy that. Satisfy you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now we're going to wrap up here, and we are going to move to locals for the after party. I encourage everyone who wants to continue watching this. You can actually. Follow us on Locals for free. You can become a member, and you can at least watch this. You're not able to interact, but you can still watch it, see what the Locals questions are, things like that. We're doing that at the end of every episode. I hope you consider getting an annual membership and having access to all of the great Oswald material in addition to other material that we are uploading. The um, reviews are pretty good. Yep. Uh, people uh, are definitely liking it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from yeah. what I read, uh, partially on locals, I haven't looked lately, but people seem to like it, Eric. Yeah, they definitely do. And I'm looking forward to getting part two 
out Pardue. at Pardue. Pardue. Pardue, yeah. But it, it is a relief. I, I loaded up the finish of part one last night. Okay. Is it up so there now? It's up there now. Everybody, oh, oh, the, the great. Full, full part one Whoa. first draft is complete. I'm going to have to tell Richard Barris because he, I, I, I DM'd oh, him. Oh, good. Okay. All right. All right. So on that, everybody, I hope you consider, consider following us to Locals. There is a link inside of the description here, Rumble. You can click it. It to take you right to this episode where we'll continue talking now. Thank you.